travelers along the path of the beam, I am known on this particular level of the tower as Jaime and Fuego, and if it please you, join me here for a bit of palaver on Hell to Stephen King. That's right, my favorite author, as you see by that uh, ginormous tower of books beyond me, right back there. Welcome to the Horror Show. You can just call me Fuego for short, and we are here to do a little bit of discussion on the 35th anniversary, because this 35th anniversary like just transpired over the course of the weekend. So that's right, we have David Cronenberg's adaptation of The Dead Zone. Yes, The Dead Zone. Uh, I actually filed this in maybe the top five Stephen King adaptations like ever, 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 ever. Yes, indeed, I most definitely do. And not just because of the fact that uh, there was a Collider article that I read the other day where they talked about the additional poignance and just, uh, I don't know, relevance, I guess, of this particular subject matter, but we don't really get that until the back half of both the novel and the film, but I mean, gosh, you've got an amazing performance by Christopher Walken, all the supporting players are good, whether it's Brooke Adams or, you know, Martin Sheen or whoever, but man, this is like... <laughs> creme de la creme of King adaptations, y'all. So, 1983, uh, obviously coming out in October and everything else, King was at the height of his precedence and awesomeness and amazingness and so on and so forth. But, uh, you know, this is one that didn't really delve as much into the scarific insanity. It was more so, it was really more so a drama at the end of the day and a drama that it's hard for me, like heavy, 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 man, especially for just the themes that they explore of just, you know, lost love and, uh, you know, just trying to piece your life back together after an accident and things of that nature. So as we always do here on The Horror Show, we're going to do overall impressions. We're going to jump into, you know, story, acting, so on and so forth. And overall impression, as I mentioned, this is one of the best King adaptations that that we have had. This is up there with, <clears throat> excuse me, this is up there with, uh, you know, boy, stand by me. Basically anything that was done by, you know, Castle Rock and Rob Reiner's peeps and stuff like that. So it's up there with stand by me. It's up there with, uh, you know, misery up there with Shawshank and all the stuff that was done, uh, you know, by the Mr. Darabont who worships at the, at the plate of, of Mr. King. It's not, it's not quite as good as Shawshank or, you know, the mist or anything like that, but it's still so insanely effectively good. And it's really curiously cool, at least for me, to see, you know, Cronenberg delving into the path of more commercial filmmaking and stuff like that. Up to this point, he had been more predominantly, you know, because he's a Canadian dude, you know, shout out to our Canucks and all our peeps up north. But, you know, he'd done Shivers, he'd done The Brood, and this same year he did Videodrome, and he would go on to do, you know, The Fly and... Uh, existence and and then even more so into the commercial territory with like Eastern Promises and uh, you know uh, uh, history of violence but <clears throat> gotta say um, for a, a, a first like dipping your toe into this sort of more mainstream adaptation it's fantastic it truly is and you know uh, lots of credit also I would imagine to, to Deborah Hill who is getting lots of love now you know rest her so, unfortunately, because of the fact that uh, Halloween 2018 crushed at the box office and, you know, she was uh, John Carpenter's producing partner, also a writing partner in a lot of ways, and she produced this film. Uh, Dino De La Rente is the guy who did uh, a lot of bad Stephen King adaptations and stuff, including one which is so bad it's good, which is uh, Maximum Overdrive, which is just coming out this week as a super deluxe edition and I have my pre-order that'll be hopefully as Cecil would say in my hot little hands very very soon but uh, yeah you had a lot of talented people behind making this movie and you know the only thing that I can say is that I know it went through various iterations and so King originally wrote a script and uh, there was just a general consensus that it was too violent it was too you know I don't know, King is not a good screenwriter, unless you're talking like, uh, I don't know, maybe a Storm of the Century or something, or probably The Stand, but everything else, I mean, I, I think he overdoes it, especially, uh, maybe he's better for TV, you know, where he knows within the constraints he has to work, but 
Ah, oh, boy, especially in those early 80s when he was putting stuff up his nose and being wild stallion man and so on and so forth. He just wasn't, he didn't understand the nature of the beast and he just, he just went for it, as you can tell with uh, <sighs> Maximal Overdrive. Anyway, I still, still love the hell out of that movie, but anyway, uh, so yeah, overall impressions, this is fantastically acted and, uh, you know, all of the fact that they trimmed doesn't really seem to matter to me very much, you know, the stuff with, uh, you know, the, the tabloid dude who we eventually see in the Night Flyer. Uh, oh boy, what else? Uh, there's even some stuff in Phoenix, you know, where Johnny decides to go and relocate and try to get his head together and so on and so forth. But, you know, everything that was trimmed, this isn't really one of those, like, clip notes kind of situations. Like, I honestly condemn many Stephen King, uh, you know, where you're condensing things, you know, into being. And this one really did things incredibly well. Um, if, if we're going to jump into the story, obviously. Uh, so, uh, Johnny Smith, a man that, man after my own heart, I even inadvertently, without necessarily thinking about it, wrote a song with my original band, my very first band when I was like 20, 21 years old, that we went through various names, you know, we had I Lie, we had Relic, we had, you know, various different things, but uh, I, I wrote lyrics for a song called A Sad Departure of a Valiant Fighter. And it was essentially just this whole idea about somebody who lays down their life and makes a massive sacrifice, but never gets any recognition for it. Profound in my estimation. Somebody who is not looking for, you know, notoriety or esteem or fanfare or anything like that. I think that that is one of the most amazing things anybody could ever do is where they're, they're laying down their life for a greater good and yet they don't want any sort of like, you know, big, uh, you know, monument put in, I don't know, put in their uh, esteem or fame or whatever. You know, they, they don't necessarily need to be remembered because they're doing what their conviction tells them is important and especially acting in the moment. And that's, that's really where, you know, some of the greatest sacrifices transpire, right? Is where, you know, it, it just, you know, it, it just clicks immediately, you're reactive and you just go for it. And that's a big theme in the back half of this book. But initially you just have this normal school teacher and props to Mr. Christopher Walken for really just embodying this character amazingly. And I love all the South Parkisms that were later done where they weren't even necessarily like making fun. They were just like paying homage as, as the term goes and stuff like that. The one where Cartman is going around with the little head thing and the cane and damn, it's one of my absolute favorite South Park episodes ever. And uh, you know, he does the whole psychic whoa, so good, so good y'all. If you haven't seen that particular episode, that is actually a future Hail the Stephen King episode that I'm working on. It's gonna get copy written like a mofo, but you know, as long as we can split the monetization as opposed to getting striked, uh, you know, I, I'm all cool with it. I want to do all of the South Park Stephen King stuff that has been just, you know, presented previously. I think it would be amazing. But so he's a school teacher, he is dating another school teacher, you know, inter workplace romance, oh boy. That doesn't work very good from my experience, but uh, you know, nonetheless, they go out to the carnival and the, the film actually moves very briskly. This is not like a super past two hours Stephen King. You know, this is, uh, you know, it, it's under two, I wanna say it's like 140 something, but <clears throat> nonetheless, uh, right after going on this date with his sweetheart of sorts, this woman that he wants to marry, and I was in that position earlier this year, crazy. Um, nonetheless, it's, it's interesting because of the fact that she invites him in and he's the noble guy and he's just like, no, some good, some things are, you know, good enough to wait for, so on and so forth. And so he decides to drive home instead of staying there with uh, Brooke Adams character, I think her name is Brooke Adams. Uh, she also went on to, she has a cameo in The Stuff, one of my favorite movies like ever, let alone Larry Cohen. Uh, she was also in Sometimes They Come Back as the female lead and stuff like that. So she has some, you know, decent, uh, and she was in Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Cannot forget that, the 70s remake that, uh, you know, Pleasance, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, uh, long story short, uh, they have something very legitimate going on between the two of them. And, uh, you know, he takes the noble route and he goes out and he drives home and there's a little, little bug. And uh, 
yeah, bad car accident, nasty stuff goes down, and he ends up in a coma for five years. How long are we talking? Five years, y'all. And um, man, I just have to say that this film, despite its age, despite the fact that it's been 35 years since it came out, these themes are so universal and transcendent that it has aged like not at all, at least in my estimation, aside from the fact that people aren't on their smartphones and, you know, addicted to their social media and everything. And, uh, you know, there is just a, a real cohesion and a real legitimacy of, of just discussion, interaction, and everything in this. And so, as he finally awakens five years later, his sweetheart is married. She has a 10-month-old. Uh, his parents are still there. They've been anxiously awaiting his awakening. And so that's nice that that eventually transpires and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, Wysak or Wisiak or, you know, whatever the, the doctor's name is that is kind of caring for him and has been at the forefront of keeping an eye on him in all of these years. He initially wakes up with enough amnesia where he's like, oh my goodness, you know, no, no, no bandages, no, you know, I actually awoke okay, I'm fine. Oh, this is so great. And then as everything starts to set in and just... The fact that the wheel of God keeps going, the clock keeps turning, and, uh, you know, sometimes people that you care about, you know, their world has moved on to make a King reference and stuff like that. And uh, it's utterly heartbreaking. Not, not just heartbreaking, we're talking heart crushing, like smash your heart into smithereens, like tiny little fragmented pieces and stuff like that. But it still makes sense though, because you can't be selfish enough to think that somebody is gonna wait around for you forever you know, especially when there's no guarantee you're eventually going to come back to this particular, <laughs> you know, level of the tower and plane of living and stuff like that. And uh, his whole rehabilitation process goes about and he finds out very quickly when he touches the hand of this nurse that he has this power of second sight, foresight, you know, whatever they want to properly describe it as. And that he helps this nurse uh, save the life of her daughter in a house fire and things just kind of go from there. Uh, we don't get the extent of the fanfare, as I mentioned, that you see in the novel. And the novel is actually wonderfully read by James Franco. A lot of people have their problems with old Frankie, dude. But, um, you know, I think he's actually a pretty good actor in the right situations. I know he had a little bit of backlash coming after he did The Disaster Artist and some things that came out and so on and so forth. But, you know, uh, as we're going to experience when we look at the next anniversary film on Saturday, which is Apt Pupil, directed by Brian Singer. Oh boy, a guy that is experiencing some uh, some shizzer right now himself. You know, you do in some ways have to separate artist from personal life and, you know, stuff like that. But, you know, Franco does a great job reading this audiobook. I, I totally recommend this audiobook. It was the first Castle Rock book. It's what started this entire little mini universe, which was so terribly in its end done on Hulu, at least in my personal estimation. If you want to see all our thoughts on the Castle Rock TV series, they're here on the Horror Show, so you can find them. But um, yeah, so he discovers this power. Uh, he has a news conference where he basically is trying to squash out, dispel, and just be done with everything. And this is really a, a three-part story in the fact that initially you get, you know, and just all the groundwork and who Johnny Smith is. And then second part is him awakening and trying to make sense of it. And we have this whole murder aspect. There's been a longtime murderer, which actually ties in with Cujo, which is one of the following books in the Castle Rock universe. But um, the third one is where everybody is talking, the, the third part and the back half, you know, of this story is where everybody talks about the current significance. Okay. And this is where I must decree, initially, that I'm a registered independent, okay? But a lot of peeps on the left wing have been making big comparisons with the Martin Sheen Stilson character and our current president. I'm not here to comment on any of that, but, you know, people who have watched this film, who have read this book, and to have seen the current political climate, I don't know, I mean, you can make your correlations wherever you want, but that's where Everybody thinks that, especially based on the Collider, you know, uh, article that I was mentioning, who knows, maybe it has some more poignance than has been previously described. But let's jump into acting. Uh, you know, it's all about walking. 
you know, walk-ins welcome, as uh, Vincent posted the other day, which is awesome. But uh, this is one where, you know, he'd done a deer hunter before and stuff like that, and, uh, you know, he was an esteemed stage actor. He had some clout, he had some reputation, but this is definitely one that put Christopher into the stratosphere as far as like his first iconic role. And he's gone on to do tons of others, but you know, in, in 1983 for this, he, it was the first time a lot of people think that he embodied and exuded his first like walkinisms and stuff like that, especially when he's like walking around in the crime scene and you know, some of his mannerisms and you know, things of that nature. It's a tremendous performance. Um, you know, the doctor is great. Brooke Adams as the love interest where things didn't work out, but you can tell they still love each other because is that something you can really turn off? You know, even if you spend all that time apart from one another, if it's somebody you genuinely love as opposed to, you know, some summer love or whatever kind of thing. I mean, those feelings don't go away. You know, you just realize, okay, this wasn't meant for me. Uh, as as they say in in the film, it, it wasn't in the cards for us, you know, so on and so forth. And I don't know, there was one of my favorite lines in the entire, it's actually one that I stole from my original band, and it's where the doctor says, you're either in possession of a very new human ability or a very old one. That for me is the best line of the entire film, aside from where Stilson's character, played by Martin Sheen, is like, we get to some doomsday scenario type stuff and pushing the button, which was a big thing in the 80s, especially, you know, with, uh, you know, the Iron Curtain being there and the Cold War and all that other stuff. And, you know, anytime someone's like, the missiles are flying. Hallelujah! That's some chilling shit, man. Like, big time, I'm, I'm telling you. So, performance-wise, you know, even though we don't see him until the back half, Sheen is good in a supporting role. Uh, Brooke Adams, as I mentioned earlier. So, and, and even we get Tom Skerritt, you know? Uh, the dude who was the captain in the original Alien film. Uh, he plays Bannerman, which is, um, well, he's basically the guy that precedes, uh, you know, Pangborn, the dude who takes things over and stuff and is featured in Castle Rock and stuff like that. But I honestly feel like they do a damn good job with him. He's also killed by Cujo spoilers. <laughs> Uh, I should have prefaced that a little bit better, but yeah, in uh, in the book that comes right after as far as Castle Rock chronology goes. But uh, Bannerman's awesome, and Scary does a damn good job playing him, at least in my estimation, when they're trying to find this, this killer, this Frank Dodd, as he ends up being and stuff like that. And so all of the performances are great. Uh, if we're going to talk cinematography, it's beautifully shot, although it's not in Maine, you know, it's, it's up north, you know, it's in Canada. We're not going to blame Canada in this instance, though, because there's so much awesome chisel that is shot up north, and uh, this is, you know, not, not an exception, obviously. Um, you know, it, it, it doubles for New England very, very well, and I guess they have better tax breaks and, you know, compensations and stuff like that, which is why U.S., you gotta get your shizzle together, man, and, you know, make sure that we have more films actually being made here instead. But, yeah, especially I adore the opening credits of this as the same lettering that Stranger Things ripped off, but, uh, you know, the dead zone as, you know, the, the pictures are just moving forward, forward, forward. So beautiful, so awesomely done. Um, the, Boy, the, the, the carnival scene is very, very well done. Um, an, a, another shot that I pointed out to when I talked at length for a couple, point, almost a couple hours about this film earlier this year on something that was initially called the John Carpenter cast. Then I was thinking it was going to be called the David Cronin cast, but to give proper credit where it's due, uh, Archer Theory, and that's on the Papago Podcast Network. I sat down with Nicholas and Christopher, Christopher R. Smith being a good friend of the show who was just recently on the Halloween review, you know, with his Carpenter insight and stuff like that. Uh, we talked at length. We watched it, and then we sat down and we talked at length, and then we divulged into all kinds of other topics and stuff like that. But yeah, we actually reviewed and discussed uh, Cronenberg's The Dead Zone at length. So this is my third time watching this film this year because I watched it previously, and then I want to do the podcast, and they're like, oh, we're going to watch it and then do the podcast. I'm like, what? I thought we were all just going to watch it before and then sit down and talk. So, so that was fun. And, you know, watching it again uh, past weekend was amazing and so very awesome. And so, 
the, yes, check out Archer Theory and you can see in, if you search Archer Theory on, I believe it's on iTunes and you know Stitcher and Podcast One and different places like that, you can get our full thoughts. Well, not, not my full thoughts because I feel like I'm condensing them pretty well here, but if you want like a deeper dive that just jumps all over the place with some actual bouncing off interaction, you know, search out the Archer Theory for The Dead Zone. And uh, yes, Christopher and Nicholas do an awesome job with that podcast. They're about to start Sofia Coppola for their third season, which is pretty rad status. And I love The Beguiled. Damn, do I love The Beguiled. It's a terrific remake that she did most recently. So um, we're going to talk in the score. Uh, once again, it's it's one of those 80s movies that has like more of an ethereal, non non-dominating score, I guess. So it's it's not really something that's gonna capture your imagination immensely, but it has that soft, surreal kind of just building aspect to it that you would want from a film that just exudes this dreamy aspect, you know, in in and of itself and in the first place, you know, because it, it feels very much like waking up from a coma. You know, like you're waking up and you're in a day state and you're trying so hard to process all of these things around you. That's what this movie perpetuates and exemplifies and does so tremendously. I love, love, love The Dead Zone, everybody. It is an amazing movie and it's one of those side kings that he has even gone on record to say sometimes less is more and trimming the fat, as I mentioned earlier, and just streamlining certain aspects. Um, granted, obviously, there's certain things that I thought they would have expanded upon a little bit better, especially in the finale where we finally get to his premonition about this political figure and what he needs to do to avert disaster, like much, much bigger scale than, you know, than you would want to see go down, you know. And that's, that, that's where those themes basically, you know, all culminate together that I have discussed here. And so, yes, I adore The Dead Zone, the book, but honestly, especially, especially the movie. Both are tremendous, and it's one of Psy King's best, easily in my top 10 uh, as far as uh, novels, and then easily in my top 5 as far as adaptations go. So, I can extend a grande gracias. I've been Jaime Fuego. You can find me on all social media sectors like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, feeding my addiction oh so fiercely. And uh, Infuegotainment is relaunching on 11.11. This one goes to 11, damn right it goes to 11, and that is what y'all can anticipate and expect on November 11th. That's when Infoigotainment is going to be officially returning with the Nightly Nerd News. We're going to have a weekly film review. We're going to have a weekly bit of, uh, the, and it's going to be like retro Fuego, so it's going to be me picking a older film that I really enjoy. And I'm also going to be doing trailer reactions and launching a Patreon. So lots of fun stuff transpiring there that I am so supremely stoked to share with all of you, especially if you have any interest in, uh, you know, assisting with, with the proceedings because thank you, Cy, it is greatly appreciated. But, you know, the, the end game is obviously the horror show where you're watching me here. Uh, make sure to subscribe if you haven't done it already and you're just stumbling upon this 35th anniversary. Uh, hit the bell so you get all the notifications about all of the different things that we do here because there are film reviews, there are uh, you know trailer reactions, there's tons of convention coverage, video game let's plays. We do our damnedest to be a all-encompassing just horror variety show and uh, we just might have something very fun brewing with Terror TV which all of you can check out on Roku right now and uh, yeah so until the Wheel of Ka comes around once more, hasta luego, Cinemigos. I hope that we get to connect sooner rather than later. And if you want to do that, we have a Hail to Stephen King Facebook group where there is stuff going down on the daily, whether it's Tower Tuesday, whether it's Pennywise Wednesday, which I'm officially starting tomorrow. I guarantee it. I'm going to throw something out there and it's going to be like, you know, throwing bait in a, you know, I don't know, some waters that are filled with ravenous sharks or something like that. It's going to get cray cray, but we show book collections. We talk constantly about what we should read next, um, what we're currently reading. Just it, it's a cool content, you know, and it's very cohesive and it's super fun. And I have tons of love for all of those peeps there. So until that instance transpires, peeps, where we all get to connect again, remember, Stay scared and read Stephen King 
And yeah, I know, you know, watch the Dead Zone, but reading it is still, at the end of the day, a far better experience.